and welcome back to Book Lust. I'm Nancy Pearl. My guest today at University Bookstore is Seattle author Betsy Hansen. Betsy, thank you for oh, coming. Thank you so much for inviting me. I'm just thrilled. Thank you. Well, I wanted to tell our, our viewing audience or listening audience that um, it's not a prerequisite that you wear, that we wear the <laughs> same color, almost the same color top, but yet we but did. But here we are. Yes. So, um, but it's great to have you here, and I'm really excited to talk to you about your, your first novel. Thank you. Um, Always Gardenia. Um, so, you ended up self-publishing the book. That's right. Mm -hmm. Could you, sh because I know we always have a lot of people watching and listening who, who want to write mm -hmm. and, um, and have written and have trouble finding an agent and finding a publisher. So I thought it would be great to talk to you about your experience. Um, okay, so, oh, yes. Specific question? Or? Uh, well, just walk me through okay. it. Okay, sure. So um, I started writing this book um, many years ago, and it went through several iterations. I began by writing 500 words a day when I had a day job still. I'd get up in the morning and write 500 words a day until I finally sp uh, spooled it out to 300 pages. And wow. I thought I was so cool that I had written this 300-page thing. And fortunately, I put it away for a while and didn't just rush into self-publication uh -huh. at that moment. Right. So then when I got it out, I thought, oh, this is definitely a first draft. <laughs> so I worked on it some more. I actually uh, hired some editing help at that point. And the, the editing, and you were, you were, you, you lived in Seattle yes, all this, this time. Yes, this was all this time, yeah. And so this was one of the, the um, editors who the editor that you hired, or the people this that you hired? This was actually the, the, uh, someone I hired before the, the final editor uh -huh. that I hired. And right. so she went over the manuscript with me, and I did some revisions. And then at that point, I decided one day I was going to try to find an agent. Right. So, which, uh, let me just interrupt again, um, it, which is one often for writers the hardest, yes. the hardest, oh, yes. hardest thing. Mm -hmm. and, and you really yeah. have to suck it up to accept all those rejections. Well, I have a rather interesting story Good. about that. Would you like yeah, to hear yes, it? Yes, <laughs> yes. So this book is my attempt to honor the work of Barbara Pym, which maybe we'll be talking yes. about later. Yes. And it's um, not at all set in her time period or her selected locales, but I wanted to, because I love her work so much, I wanted to see if I could channel some of her sensibility, some of her humor. So I, I believe very much as a writer and also when you're entering into the publishing world, you need to target very mm -hmm. carefully. The shotgun approach does not work. So I thought, maybe there's an agent out there who likes Barbara Pym. <laughs> so thank you, Google. I Googled literary agent, Barbara Pym. And boom, wow. up popped this interview with a New York agent who had been asked, what kind of books do you like? And he said, I like this, I like that, but I also like the quiet books like those of Barbara Pym. <laughs> so I went to the website for his agency, found his name and his address, and fortunately, this agency only took paper submissions, oh. which is rather unusual. Uh -huh. Most often nowadays, as you know, it would be um, an email query with attachment of right. a sample. So I looked at the submission guidelines very carefully. I got my little sample ready. I put it in one of those lovely little manila you know, envelopes like we used to use back in the day. I addressed it to him. And then on, I made a little note on the envelope. And I said, attention, novel in the style of Barbara Pym. <laughs> I sent it off on a Thursday. We are always warned not to expect an answer from anyone in the publishing world within right. six weeks, two exactly. months, three I months. Say, I was going to say months and months. So often. I was like, OK, I did that. I mailed it on a Thursday. On Tuesday, he called me. Wow. So I, the, the lesson from that is targeting either works or helps. Uh -huh. And, and so one of the pieces of advice that I always give, because I always get this question about an, a, how to find an agent, is to look for 
to go to the bookstore or a library and look at a book that you, that your book is like. Absolutely. And Absolutely. see, and now it's pretty easy, again, thank you, Google, to find out who the editor is. In addition to which, most of the time, the writers well, think uh, who, you're, yeah, who the agent yeah. is for that book. It's such good advice. Yeah. That is such good advice. Yeah. And so I ended up working with this agent. He did a very good job. He was very committed to the book. He very much encouraged me. I'm so appreciative of that. Mm -hmm. He's a person with many years of experience. He submitted to many very reputable editors, mm -hmm. and we had 19 rejections. Mm -hmm. um, so are you generally a very confident person? I mean, how I know that that would be that would have been really hard for me it to was deal hard with. it was hard because i felt like we were getting so close mm -hmm. and it had been a long journey for mm -hmm. me so there were days when he would email me and say sorry to bring you this news on monday morning yeah and i'd cry sometimes yeah. but yeah. generally i have learned over the years you you rejection is part of it you mm -hmm. just have to keep moving forward right. so finally i decided that I needed to get going with this. I believed in the book, and mm -hmm. he believed in the book, which helped me believe right. in the book. Sure. And many of the comments from the editors who rejected us still had positive things to say. So I felt confident that it had value. Frida Ham's apartment was a few blocks from the University of the Northwest in one of the older brick buildings near a large hospital and medical clinics. Gardenia wondered if, back in the day, some developer had created these three to four-story apartment buildings for the nurses who worked in the hospitals. Career girls, nurses or secretaries or teachers, used to live their whole lives in apartments. As single women, they had no customary right to aspire to owning a tidy little home among married people with children. Because the apartments were near the crest of First Hill, from the upper floors, these hard-working women might have had a view of ferry boats chugging across the sound, on a fine day, they may have started their mornings with a view of the tips of the Olympics beyond Bainbridge Island. But that was before the neighborhood in downtown Seattle had filled with skyscrapers. No way Frida had any view now. Frida buzzed Gardenia into the large foyer, complete with an arched entryway and small decorative stained glass windows. The woman who dwelt here for 30 or 40 years must have kept themselves nimble and trim with all the climbing of the wide central staircase, Gardenia thought. Was because because the book is Barbara Pimish, um, was it that was were the positive responses to the characters often? Uh huh. Mm -hmm. Although they ranged, uh. because some people would say, "I I loved the character of Gardenia, but I didn't like something else, uh -huh. whatever that was." And right. other people would say, "I liked something else, but I didn't yes, like the character." Yeah. character of Gardini, right. so it's like, thanks a lot, you right. know? <laughs> yeah. Um, and then I, I would mention this to my agent, and he said, yeah, I see that every day. You know? and, and doesn't that just show you that, um, that really liking or not liking a book or liking a portion of a book or not liking a book is, is so um, individual oh, it and is. so personal? It is. It really is. Right. And what we like to read is so much a function of so many things about who we are. Right, yes. So, um, however, there is something called competent writing. Yes. And that exists, I believe, in all genres. Uh-huh, I agree. So I decided I was going to independently publish this. It made me very nervous. One of my concerns was that I needed a good, what we call line editor, right. as well as perhaps a structural editor, to someone just to go over it very carefully with mm -hmm. me. If you have your manuscript with a traditional publishing house, the editor who takes it on has a professional stake in its success. Right. If you go out into the world and try to hire a freelance editor, they may or may not have the integrity to really push you. Mm -hmm to make your book better. Mm -hmm. It's very easy to say, oh yeah, this is great, yeah, okay, I'll take that check, goodbye. Yeah. So this, this was my main concern. Who am I gonna find that's really gonna put my feet to the fire? Mm -hmm. This has to be as good as it can possibly be. Right. Even though I know it's pretty good right. as it is, right. I want it to be prof absolutely professional. So thank you, Google. I, when I went, I looked up, 
freelance editors, Seattle. And boom, up popped the Northwest Editors yes, Guild. Right. You, you maybe know yep, of it. I yep, did not. Yes. And there were all these little thumbnail photos of the people who were in the organization, members of the guild. And I looked at some of them, and they were younger women who looked a little too glamorous or something. I thought, I think that person would intimidate me. <laughs> but then there was this one photo of this woman who just looked very intelligent and kind, and she was about my age, so I thought, she must have experience. Yeah. So I contacted her, we got together, I gave her the manuscript, and I said, the first thing I want you to do is sit down with a pot of tea, read it through as if you were a reader just reading it, and let me know what you think. Mm -hmm because I wanted to get an idea, are we, am I on the right track at all? So she did that, and she wrote back a very long, detailed editorial letter mm -hmm. that mentioned about everything that I wanted a reader to experience in the book. I was very pleased. Wow, that's So she wonderful. basically got it. Yeah. So then we moved on into the line editing, structural editing, and she was great. This is Robin Cruz, and she lives in West Seattle. Uh, she had a great sense of humor, but she also saw things that needed some help. Mm -hmm. And she suggested that I delete two chapters, which I did, and I'm glad I did. Mm -hmm. So that was wonderful. Now, the next thing is, I love books as physical objects. Right. And the other thing I see with self-published books often is because of budget, no doubt, they often look less professional than those right. from a traditional publishing yeah. house. And, and I have to say that what struck me, I mean, I had read the manuscript of this because you shared right. it with me several years ago, I think, <laughs> by now. Um, but when I saw this book, I, this is a professional looking. I Thank mean, this, you. this is a beautiful, beautiful Thank book. Thank you. Thank you. So now my, my quest was to find someone who could help me make it into a good quality book product. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Google. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I Googled printing companies, Seattle, and up popped a printing company in Centralia, Washington of all places, Gorham Printing. It's been in business for many years. I'd never heard of it. They have clients from all over the country. I took the train down to meet up with the designer, Kathy Campbell. I took some samples of books that I liked, uh -huh. also a couple I didn't like. Uh -huh. We sat down together, we went over my ideas, talked about the book and about possible cover options, and she agreed with, uh, totally understood what I was saying. Again, right. she got it. Yeah. And we went over paper stock, that, uh, which is also quite important, yes. different type fonts. Right, right. So she then took my ideas and came up with this cover. And my husband, actually, who's an uh, landscape architect and, and artist, did the um, illustration here, uh -huh. the silhouette illustration. Right. And of then Arnold she, and Gertie. Yes, yeah. and then she came up with the rest. Uh -huh. uh, and then I found, through my editor, I found a good proofreader, and it all came together. The nice thing, too, is that in September, I decided to go out on my own. By March, I had a book in my hand. Uh -huh. And you know yes, that in right. the traditional publishing world, right. it's at least a year. Sep yeah, September, you sign a contract maybe a year later, right. maybe a year and a half or two yeah. years later. So right. that was a very satisfying. Yeah. Now, what did you, I mean, one of the, one of the difficulties that independent, um, that publishers who go the, that writers who go the independent route often run up against is that is the promotion yes. part of it yes. and how, mm. and some people are just not cut out to do that as, I mean, you're a writer or yeah. you're, you're right. a, per a self-promoter or <laughs> right. in one yeah. way or another, but you've sort of, you've conquered that hurdle, well, it seems. Well, I, I feel fortunate that I am not at all intimidated about being in front of people. I was a teacher for many years. Mm -hmm. I've done some performing. So for me, getting up in front of people and presenting is like, bring it on. Uh -huh. I know that's not true for a lot of writers. Right. Could be even most writers because it's a very private, solitary enterprise. Yes. I have to say I'm not quite sure yet how it's all going to go. It's, mm -hmm. So far it's been going very well. Mm -hmm. I've had 
uh, I staged my own book launch at the Good Shepherd Center in Seattle, mm -hmm. and it was very successful. I also had a uh, author presentation at Third Place Books Ravenna in mm -hmm. Seattle. I have some books here at University Bookstore. I'm trying to support uh, independent bookstores by getting my book in their mm -hmm. on their shelves. I also um, had some postcards printed up with the cover art, and then on back on the back is a blurb and some ordering information, and then I put a stamp on it. So everyone who buys a book, I give them a few of these, and I say, if you know someone else who might be interested, you could send them. What this. a good idea! Uh huh making it easy for them to just put an address on right. and send it to a friend. Right. I am on Facebook and I try mm -hmm. to keep people informed on Facebook about what's going on yeah. with the book. I'm planning to do a national blitz of sending this postcard out. I had a goal in mind to sell a certain number of books in all 50 states so I made a list of everyone I know or someone I know might know in all 50 states and except for some outliers like Mississippi and Alabama uh -huh. I pretty much knew wow. someone or knew someone who knew someone yep. so I'll be sending out cards to all those people with a note just to let them know that uh -huh. it's out there I also attended the Barbara Pym conference in Boston this March, I wrote a short story for one of their contests that was one of the three top in the... And was it based on... <clears throat> no. Oh, totally different. Totally different. The, the wow. task was to write a 2,000 word short story using one of Barbara Pym's characters, oh. one or more. Oh, so who did you choose? I had just read Crampton Hodnett, uh -huh. which I highly recommend for anyone who doesn't know Barbara Pym. It was her first book. It was actually published after yeah. she died, right. but I think the manuscript was pretty much complete. Uh -huh. And I chose uh, Miss Morrow and Miss Doggett, who have a very interesting relationship, and I got permission to let them time travel. So the story actually takes place <laughs> in Seattle. But fortunately, my story was one of three of the top uh, winners, uh -huh. and so I was invited to read the story at the Barbara oh, Pym Conference, lovely. which was totally fun. Again, it was no problem for me to stand up and right. read this. So I've made some connections through the Barbara Pym Society, which have been really fun. And so talk a little bit about, you know, Barbara Pym is one of my favorite I know, authors I know. as well. <laughs> and, um, and, and so how would you describe Barbara Pym to somebody out in the audience who is not familiar at all with Barbara Pym, which makes perfect sense because yeah. she is not, um, she wrote in the 50s and 60s, right. and, and, and the books British were out of print for a yes, long time. Yes. And you know who else was a big fan of Barbara Pym was Philip Larkin. Philip Larkin, the he, poet. Brought he brought her out, her of, the, exactly, out of the desert, out of he? obscurity. Yes, yes, yes. I'm sure you know, as a Barbara Pym fan, that describing her books to other people is difficult. Well, that's why I <laughs> wanted you to do it and not me. <laughs> So I start by saying she's in the Jane Austen tradition. Yes, that's a good way of putting she it. She writes of small worlds, small dramas. Her characters are not people that are dynamic or fabulous necessarily. They're sort of common people. Not mm -hmm. common, yeah, but they're ordinary. normal people. Right. They spend a lot of time discussing jumble sales and the Close, rector at the, the rector. church. Someone's always falling in love with the curate. The curate, <laughs> right, right. There's tea drinking. Yeah. She talks about baked beans on toast mm -hmm. and interested in what the women might be wearing. And I was tickled by two, two references in the book, especially um, one about tea drinking, which I'll get back to, but um, Gardenia, who is a widow in, in the book, a, a re pretty recent widow, two years, right, I think, when yes. we meet her. Uh, her husband has um, ha has died, and she does not like the phrase "passed away." So I said, "Died deliberately." Yeah. There, um, where she talks about the dinner that she has of of um, beans on toast, <laughs> and she buys the day old artisanal bread and to be toasted, and then the thick beans. I I, I love that. The other thing about tea drinking, um, it, it, there's a there's a little discussion. Uh, when Gardenia visits the poetry professor uh, at the University of the Northwest, 
where she is now the um, secretary or administrative assistant yes, yes. to the English <laughs> department. Um, and, and they talk about whether you should put milk in first in your cup or whether you should put the tea in first and then add the milk. And I wanted to ask you uh, if you're familiar with a British poet named Brian Bilston. I'm not. Well, I think that he 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 is he he calls himself the Twitter poet, and and um, he mostly does uh, very funny, um, intelligent poems. But one of them that that line in the book, that section in the book, when they're talking, when she and Frida, Gardenia and Frida, are talking about tea drinking, brought to brought to mind his, one of his very short poems, which goes, just when she thought it could get no worse. She watched him pour milk in her teacup first. Oh! <laughs> <laughs> and pouring milk in your teacup first, I just was talking to somebody, and that's a, what the lower classes do. Oh. Although, although I've also heard that I their have upper also, classes exactly. did it to keep the porcelain from yes. being yes. cracked. Or yes, or, right, from the hot water. Mm -hmm. And Fortnum and Mason, I mean, I just did a lot of tea research. <laughs> <laughs> when I was reading this, but I, I, what I remember is that Fortnum and Mason recommend putting the milk in first, which is what I do. Through a far doorway was Frida's bedroom, with a pile of clothing spilling out of a wicker laundry basket onto the bed. The largest window in the living room had a pleasing view of a stout hawthorn tree, not yet in bloom, but that Gardenia suspected would be capable of providing a fine backdrop of bright pink flowers in May. I always put milk in my cup first. That's what the Brits do, Frida said, pouring for herself. Go ahead and fix yours any way you like. Binding one's tannins, Gardenia said as she reached for the milk jug and the teapot. Pardon? That's what my husband and I used to call it. The milk in the tea binds the tannins and makes it easier on the stomach. Used to call it? Did you change your mind? Frida asked. My husband's dead. Gardenia said. Oh, sorry, I should have remembered that. It's okay. Gardenia got busy sipping her tea. It's difficult to find novels with humor. Mm hmm Yes. Yeah. Humor is very difficult to write. On the surface, it seems like it must be the easiest thing to write because it's light, it makes you laugh, but in my opinion, it is the hardest to write. Very few novelists try. Mm hmm And there's a sense that if a book is ponderous and important, right. it must be meaningful. Meaningful. It must be much harder to write. And if you're writing little funny things, that must be just like writing for kids or something. Which, by the way, writing for kids is very difficult. It's very difficult. Um, so, all of us who love Barbara Payne, we love to laugh at when we're reading. And I. I always ask people, what was your first laugh out loud in public moment when you were reading Barbara Pym? Oh, what was yours? I was, nine, it was sometime in the early 80s. I had a very tedious temp job in downtown Seattle. It was a rainy day. I was riding home on the bus, <laughs> crowded bus. I was tired. I opened Jane and Prudence. Mm -hmm. And I was reading it, and there's a line in there where they're going, she goes into a cafe with her husband, and they're offered Toad in the Hole, which is uh -huh. a British menu item. Right. And she says to the waitress, oh, my husband can't take toad. And I just <laughs> burst out laughing. So maybe many, I don't know if you remember your first laugh out loud moment, but it's typical of Barbara Pym readers that we have laughed out loud right. in a public place. I think that, but with her books too, there's always um, a level of of loneliness yes. or, or a little melancholy, a little melancholy. <clears throat> and I think my laugh aloud moment comes from um, I think the book is uh, No Fond Return mm -hmm. of Love, where Dulcie Mainwaring is the main character, right. and she mm -hmm. and the first line is it, something like it's unusual to go to an academic conference to I don't know, follow what or something about that. I used to know that line by heart. Um, and fall in love or something. Yes. But um, yeah, and I remember still I, how much I loved. I, yeah, I, I love Barbara Pym as well. So who else do you read? Well, <laughs> I go back. Uh huh. Uh huh. And I have lots of friends who go back. Yeah. Yes. Like back to Dickens. Not Dickens so much. I mean, I I I very much appreciate reading the classics because 
having written a novel, I see how terribly difficult it is. Mm -hmm. And two things have happened to me. My brother-in-law asked me recently, he said, now that you've written a novel, does it make it more difficult for you to read other people's novels? Mm -hmm. And I said, you know, it's a very good question. No one else has asked me that. And the answer is yes. Yeah. Uh, I see how difficult it is. And I have less patience for people who are writing what I think is not from their own heart, mm -hmm. maybe for to meet a trend or to satisfy somebody else, mm -hmm. or maybe aren't following some of the rules of craft that I have labored long to master yeah, right. or try to master. Right. So there's that. On the other hand, when I read something that's well done, I just swoon. I am so much more appreciative than I might have been before I tried doing it myself. I, I think that um, having written a novel as well, yes. uh, what, what has changed in my reading is um, now I'm very conscious of the decisions that the author mm -hmm. made and to include a particular scene or to include some, um, some plot, some taking the plot somewhere that clearly it didn't need to go and 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 that's a new I, I really never thought about it in those terms. Right, you're, you're, look, you're reading as a practitioner. As a practitioner, I, right. I have some quotes I'd like to share that have been guidance for me. May I do that? Yeah, do we, we have, have about time? a few minutes. Okay, good. So I encourage anyone who wants to write a novel to write the book that they want to read. Yes, that's what I say. And here's too. a quote that I have in my writer's room. The whole duty of a writer is to please and satisfy himself, and the true writer always plays to an audience of one. Let him start sniffing the air or glancing at the trend machine, and he is as good as dead, although he may make a decent living. That's E.B. <laughs> e. White. E. White. So. And Barbara Pym herself says, so I try to write what pleases and amuses me and hope that a few others will like it too. Yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, to me, that's what—that's the most important thing. And and I know in my experience that if I had at any time thought, "Will an editor ever like this?" or "Who wants to read this?" or "Who would want to read?" Is it going to be popular? Right. Yes. Yes. Or even, <laughs> is it going to be published? I, I think that that would have been like uh, just deep sixing the yes. whole thing. It, I, I it mean, makes I, you totally self-conscious. Right. And nervous. Yeah, and I think for me the most important thing was always that I'm I'm going to write a book that I'm that that I'm going to write exactly the kind of book exactly. I like to read, yes. which is just what you did. Yes, yes. Yeah. And it feels good because then you know you've satisfied yourself and what whatever anyone else thinks is fine. Doesn't matter right. because you've done what you wanted to do. So, do you think you're going to work on another novel, or what's well, your feeling? Well, my one of my abiding passions is our um, middle grade novels for children, uh -huh. and I have now two manuscripts. One that's in in deep revision process now, that I hope to finish soon, and another one that will be coming out to be revised soon. And uh -huh. then I also started a third one. Wow. So. Um, those are, those are the next things on the list. I also have a full-length play that I'm working on. I do like writing plays uh -huh, as well. Uh -huh. And I, I'm just kind of enjoying Where this you are. process of sharing yeah. with readers. It's really so delightful to share. Well, Betsy, I want to thank you so much for coming by today and sharing your story. And I want to thank you for the book, Always Gardenia, and for sh really for for being so willing to, um, to share your experience. Nancy, it's been such a pleasure. Thank you very much. You're very welcome. <laughs>